My guest today is Dr. Tara Anderson. In her practice, she takes an evidence-based approach when treating, reversing, and preventing chronic disease. You might want to get a piece of paper and a pen and take some notes. She'll give us simple tips for reducing toxicity and improving our everyday health. Thank you for being here, Dr. Anderson. I've been wanting to talk with you for a while and we, your schedule is busy with your new practice. So thanks for squeezing us in. Oh, thank you for having me. I have uh, had conversations with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis and in a group setting when you presented a lot of information at, at one time, you, you have such knowledge on top, topics of toxicity and uh, hormone disruptors, all the things that are talked about today. And I wanted to have you here to try and give people actionable steps that they can take to make simple changes. And then if on their own, give them some resources where they can take a deeper dive. So how about we, how about we start with that? Yeah, let's get into it. Okay, here we go. So let's first talk, what do you think is the number one, what is the number one point that you'd want to make? What, what topic of discussion? Is it diet? Is it toxicity? What, what are the things that you'd want to address first and foremost? Probably a, a diet, but I think that diet and toxicity kind of go hand in hand. So diet, let's talk about that. Um, a lot of people get overwhelmed thinking about all the things that they might have to change at one time, but also they, they don't really understand where to start. So what would you say is the toxicity in our diet and what simple changes can be made and why it's important to make them? So why it's important to make changes first and foremost is, is understanding that what affects our health drastically and undermines trying to make healthy choices that also contributes to long lasting systemic inflammation is toxicity that's already in our food, but also food choices that keep us in a state of insulin resistance over a long period of time. Um, that is a slippery slope into chronic disease. Um, and so, so finding or picking foods or choosing foods that keep you out of insulin resistance as much as possible and into a state of insulin sensitivity that's as clean as possible, you're tackling two things, good quality food, as well as a decreased toxicity profile over time. Now, for some people, it, how, how do you, I have a friend who is wearing one of the, um, like the little poke thing on her arm it's and it's connected to her app and she's able to learn like she ate four different types of apples and, and one really spiked her insulin the others didn't or something like that so short of having something like that on your arm how do we start to recognize which foods we're sensitive to if we don't have a way of monitoring monitoring that in a technical way to be quite honest, the continuous glucose monitor has become hands down the most invaluable tool for a practitioner to have working with their patient because everybody's body is so biologically fundamentally different in the way that we respond to food that it's pretty impossible to know how your body is responding without having something like that. That data is so invaluable. You can't really feel a glucose spike in the absence of extreme diabetes. So being able to see the way you metabolically respond, even if you only wear one for two weeks, becomes incredibly valuable, actually. So when you make the connection between that insulin spike, is that also, are these also going to be the foods that cause the inflammation? Depends. That's a good question. It depends. It depends on you and it depends on your body. You know, you're always going to spike right after you eat. That's a normal metabolic response to food. The question is, is how far are you spiking and where do you drop to and where do you sit outside of a meal, right? And the choices that we make when we eat affects those things. So again, that's why the device becomes so important. It really is a crucial device to try to get, to be able to see where you're at metabolically. Well, I can only speak for women, women because I'm a woman. And I know that a lot of times weight loss is associated with how our pants feel, if they fit, how we look in our clothing, we're getting ready to go on a vacation or we have a big event or we want to be comfortable in wedding pictures, whatever it is. Um, so sh what I found having dinner with that friend recently was this is a real good look at just what we're doing to our bodies every single time we put food inside. And if yeah. that isn't a way to at least choose the right apple, yeah. then I don't know what is. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I, I hear um, frustration from patients every single day about, you know, hitting a brick wall of not being able to lose weight. How do I, how do I thin out in my, you know, my midsection? And of course, hormones play a role in that thyroid function plays a role in that. There's a lot of things that play a role in that, but glucose management is fundamentally one of the most important things. And what decides what way that's going to go are the choices that you make at the table. So, so let's say you can't afford or insurance doesn't approve this glucose monitor option. And there are many available because after I had dinner with my friends, I did my own dive and, and, and I'm ordering one for myself to see what that's like. And, and there, it is expensive at first, but like you said, even if you don't subscribe annually or monthly for a year and you just take really good notes for two weeks, that's, that's a good yeah. start. So that yeah. is an option, but just say it isn't an option. Uh, what are some ways that people can make a difference in just what you know as a doctor and person of science and medicine are the triggers that they could stay away from? It's it's what we hear well, a lot, probably the breads and pastas and things like that. But really, what are some of the things that change, simple changes that could be made to simple start? Simple changes. One of the biggest that always gets overlooked is dehydration. Mm -hmm. most people, um, I call, I call it like the chronically like under, um, under spoken or miss, miss, misguided a nutrient that just never gets addressed. And that's hydration. Hydration is fundamentally at the root cause of irritable bowel, of bloating, of, um, you know, chronic dry skin, a lot of things that I see. And, you know, I will hear when I, when I address hydration, first and foremost is man, you know, I'm drinking so much water. So I've actually heard a patient tell me, you know, I, I drink a gallon of water every day and I'm, I'm like, you're, you're dehydrating yourself. That's too much water. If you have no electrolyte replacement in with a mix of what you're eating or what you're drinking, you know, the, the electrolyte replacement's fundamentally important. That's one thing you can be doing. Okay. Let's okay. talk about the water then. I, I grew up here in eight glasses a day. Is that enough? Is it based on weight? What's it based activity? There's probably a lot of things that go into that. A lot of things, for sure. A lot of things, because if you're an athlete or if you're somebody that, you know, is spending, if you're not an athlete, you're spending a lot of time in the gym and, you know, your sweat profile is vastly different from someone who's sedentary. I think that a really good rule of thumb is a one-to-one. -one. And what I mean by that is for every one liter of water you're drinking, follow that with a liter of electrolyte replacement. If you're somebody that is not very active and there's no way you're drinking a liter of water every day, um, you know, I would say a half a liter, if you're drinking, if your norm is to drink a half a liter every day, follow that with a half a liter of electrolyte replacement. The goal would be a liter. That would be really great for some balance. Um, but I just say a one-to-one -one is a really good ratio. And then with the water. So when you say electrolyte replacement, that needs to be a clean option as well. Absolutely. Yeah. What you're looking for is something that doesn't have a lot of additives, a lot of binders or sugar. Okay. We're looking for just the fundamental replacement of, you know, your calcium, your potassium, and your magnesium being the first and foremost, the, the first thing that gets depleted. And so having that balance back in really is wonderful for the health and the, and the density, the nutrient density of your blood brain barrier. Got it. Okay. Let's take a break. Let's, we'll start talking about toxicity. You are the reason for my water bottle. <laughs> you are the reason we'll be back in just a moment. Let's talk now, we've talked about water and glucose levels and things like that and different ways that we can monitor and improve those things. Let's talk then about toxicity because um, I was at a, an event that you were speaking at and you were talking about plastics in the water bottle. And even though they say they're free of these things, they're not necessarily free of the other things. And the one thing I felt like I could do when I left there was throw away my water bottle because if I'm drinking filtered water, which you recommended, and let's say I'm drinking all that I, that I should, and I'm doing the one-to-one -one suggestion you made in the first segment, and then I'm putting it into a plastic bottle, well, it's, it, it doesn't really make sense to me. So my friend had given me this beautiful water bottle that's, you know, stainless steel and all the things. And, uh, and this is what I've been drinking out of every day since. It's a little harder to get used to because I liked seeing my water. I liked mm -hmm. having the you know, the writing on the side telling me, you know, I'm supposed to drink by a certain time, but it's a small adjustment that I felt good about making. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about toxicity and the small adjustments we can make. 
yeah, I think that it's just important that, you know, you make one small good decision, you know, every day, you know, those are, these are simple things that we can control, right? And so something simple as switching from a disposable plastic bottle that we're throwing away and switching to something that is aluminum, you know, the, the bottles that you can keep and refill, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get a better, less toxic, endured water. Okay. Right. Um, I think yeah, that because you don't other... think about the history of that water, you don't has sat in no. all these temperatures, probably a lot of heat in that water bottle that you buy at the store. Now, granted, if you need some water, then, then that's where you're going to get it. If, if it's out of convenience, but when you can plan ahead and have your own safe bottle. For sure. Absolutely. And other little things that you can do like every, every, you know, every night after dinner or, um, you know, in the morning when you're making breakfast and you happen to have some leftovers, getting into the habit of every, every time you can put those leftovers into glass rather than a plastic, that's one less plastic container your food is sitting in. I mean, you're not, you know, most people are not going to go through their pantry and get rid of all their plastic. That's okay. But it's one little thing that you can do over time that makes a big difference. You know, there's wonderful filters that you can get for, you know, very inexpensive on Amazon or at Lowe's or Home Depot or something like that, where, you know, you're putting that are built into your shower heads so that the water that's coming onto you is not toxic, you know? And when I say toxic, there, there are minuscule levels of, you know, things that leach into the water that come through our skin. Our skin absorbs 60% of what it touches. So the better we can, you know, do to minimize the toxic profile that's around us, every day you get a little bit better. I've recently made changes in my skincare. I've never really been big on following a huge, you know, routine with my skincare. And now I'm 51. So of course now I'm thinking about it more, uh, but I've made some changes in that. And I've always been pretty, like I, I use the, the safe deodorant without the aluminum. What is it that aluminum, mm -hmm. yeah, aluminum that we're supposed yeah. to avoid. Um, I've been doing that for years. Um, you know, so those little things too, if you think about the deodorant that you put under your arm goes right into your glands, mm -hmm. you know, these kinds of things, yeah. what about for our bodies that we can do with what we put on top of, you know, the biggest organ we have. Yeah. And so that's where phthalates come in, right? Which is phthalates and sulfates. You probably have heard a lot about, you know, and these, these chemicals are in tons of products. I mean, think about, you know, just to just to look at the, the product profile of what we allow in the United States versus Europe, you know, in the United States, we only have 13 banned toxic chemicals that are allowed to be in our fragrances, in our lotions, and in our body washes and in our cosmetics. In Europe, there are 13,000 banned chemicals. So just because you can go into your favorite store and buy something doesn't mean that it's healthy for you. You can go into the store and buy something and give you lung cancer as well. <laughs> that doesn't right. mean it's okay. So I think just taking that extra step to make sure that if you're putting something on your body in the form of cosmetic or lotion or body wash, look for it to be sulfate free and phthalate free. These are another form of microtoxins that really do get in and, and disrupt hormone function over time. Which is another topic that you covered in the discussion that I attended about how these things are leading to infertility. What right. was the ratio? What was the statistic you gave me? One the ratio is staggering right now and it's worsening. Um, you know, we have, it's, you know, we're uh, like under five now, as far as one in five uh, men, one in five women um, that, that are unable to, to procreate. Like we're not, we're not able, <laughs> we're not able to, to, to be fertile. And this is a lot to do with the decades. We're going on four decades of being exposed to microtoxins that, and to, to an unprecedented rate that we've never seen. You know, I was um, actually just listening to some of the most forefront speaking um, scientists um, on the globe about this just a few weeks ago. And they're, you know, they're also saying that we need to be waking up to this because we are now, we've met all the criteria um, of on the endangered species list as a species, just because we cannot procreate. And this is, this is coming down to toxicity is what they're finding out. And so just, you know, you can't live in a bubble, right. but you can make small choices every day that make you make yourself healthier overall over time. And part of that is making those choices for our children now, because right. they're not suddenly dealing with infertility issues because they're at the age that they want to have children. 
this is building in their system for years before it actually comes time to want to start a family, perhaps. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, looking for phthalates is really, really important. You know, when when you have the choice to, you know, put even just something like, you know, diaper rash cream all over, you know, the genital area of a child, read the label and make sure that it's phthalate free. It's those little choices over time that end up, you know, being better off, you know, for and the child. And we're building habits in ourselves in particular. I know that as a mother, I, I take, I've taken much better care of my child in, in his life than I've taken of myself sometimes. For sure. So if I'm yeah. going to do those things, then hopefully I'm, I, you know, we start them young to understand the habits of looking for those things as well, you know, Absolutely. shopping with them in the supermarket and helping them look at the labels and teaching them these things along the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just building good practice, you know, building a practice on food, you know, building a practice on, you know, being able to identify what toxin even looks like, you know, that's, that's something fun to do with, with a population of patients to take them into a store and actually show them how to read a label because we don't know, we, and you don't know what you don't know. So you don't even know what to identify, then you don't know if it's good or bad. And so that's why the dialogue and opening that up with a patient is really, really important so that they even know what they should be looking for. Right. Well, and what's the quote? When you know better, you do better, right? Exactly, right. Okay. Let's take a quick break and we're going to finish up. And uh, we're just trying to give simple, actionable steps to make tiny changes that hopefully last a lifetime. We'll be back in just a moment. We are just finishing up with you, uh, Dr. Anderson, and I feel like we've covered a lot of information. I think that maybe it's a little overwhelming for people to think about making great big changes. So you've said many times it's the little changes. Um, what can you say about that, about the, say, for example, someone's recently diagnosed with diabetes. That's a lot of habits that would have to change quickly. Mm -hmm. So how do you address certain things like that? And how much does the provider, where does that come into play? Well, I just think it's really important that, you know, regardless of what your chronic illness is or, you know, diagnosis is, or even if you aren't suffering from diagnosis and you're in the prevention lane and you don't want to ever be in the seat of getting a diagnosis, I think it's really important that you are partnered with a provider that can, like, can come alongside you and be with you every step of the way of your healthcare journey. And being in the central Washington Valley, there are a lot of choices. There are wonderful providers here that are incredibly intelligent, incredibly, you know, smart and have a lot of diversity in being able to offer, which is a lot of places don't have that, you know, we do here, which is wonderful. And I think that it's important to, you know, have maybe both sides, having a healthcare provider that is in the preventive medicine lane, along with having a provider that is in the conventional medicine lane. There's a place for both at the table. One can lead you along that road of prevention so that you hopefully never get to that place of chronic illness diagnosis. But if you ever do, there's a place for conventional medicine that can meet, meet the need as well. And the combination of the two can really get you to the best outcomes. One of the things that I've said to people, because I end up talking with a lot of people about patient advocacy and things that they might be in a health crisis. And I always say, no offense, I'm just going to use surgeons as an example. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily need my surgeon to have the, the most perfect bedside manner. Right. Um, I, I need my surgeon to be brilliant in the operating room and talented right. and gifted in that way. But my primary care provider has to care about me on a personal level. Right. And part of that is my responsibility. When people come to me and they say, oh, you know, I, I don't like my doctor. I don't ever just say, well, go get a new doctor. I say first, well, how are you contributing to that relationship? For example, uh, at least once a year, <laughs> women are generally in a room with their provider for a good 20, 40 minutes. And it's, a, you know, and, and it's kind of a embarrassing quiet, right? Because we're getting this exam and all these things are happening. That is an opportunity to make sure your provider knows a little bit about you, knows a little bit about your life and can have some insight to you beyond just being the patient so that you can start to build that rapport. Now, sometimes you're going in with the flu and you just want your Z-Pack and go home, but let's just say you have those opportunities to build that relationship. So yeah. I always want to put that question in, in people's minds, a patient's mind, what are you doing to contribute to that relationship, that communication? Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's important. You know, I just think that, again, you brought up a good point of recognizing, you know, that you want your surgeon to be the best surgeon in the room and utilizing his skill set when you need it. Right. 
the, the, the preventative health care lane is designed to spend a lot of time with you to get you to your end goals of optimizing your health. That is not necessarily the same design of healthcare when, you know, you're going in to see your specialist and you, you know, I hear a lot of complaints. I only have 10, 15 minutes with my pay, with, with my provider. Well, because that is not what those visits are designed for. They're not designed to partner with you for your long-term prevention. Mm -hmm. So finding a mix of both, I, I really do see patients flourish when they have the, the, the best of both worlds going on and just making sure that, you know, you, you understand the difference between the two, but having both is really important. When you see a patient for the first time, whether they're coming in to combat a chronic illness or they're coming in to you from a preventative point of view, those visits look very different. Yes. I, well, just in, pre, in preventative medicine in general versus, you know, when I was working as part of a system, you know, it, it just, the whole system is different. And so now, you know, all of my visits are, are pretty lengthy, which I would say that I would speak to, that's probably very similar to any type of preventive medicine um, provider you're going to see. Um, their, their practices are all pretty much set up to spend lots of time um, because that's the nature of what you're what you're doing, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Let's talk about habits and mindset just as we finish up here, because so much of what you're talking about is the habits that have been instilled in us. And I'm reading some really good books right now on mindset and the habits that, you know, like for example, our, when we get into a shower, there's an automatic habit that's there. You know, we wash our hair first or we wash our body. You know, we have a system. We get up, we make our bed automatically, or maybe we make it after we have a cup of coffee. I don't know, whatever it is. Maybe you don't make your bed at all. But if you were to look at the little changes that's required of preventative and reactive uh, medicine, where is the mindset in that? And how do you help as a provider? in terms of making sure people can take it a step at a time? Well, I think the most important thing is one is spending the time with the patient. That's really, really important and listening mm -hmm. to where they've been to get them and get their goals, put that together to get them where they're trying to go. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really, really important because the more you listen and the more you hear where they've been, um, where their pitfalls have been in getting them to where they're trying to go, helping them to avoid that moving forward. Um, I think that, you know, when you're helping them to and guiding them for what their next healthcare steps are going to be, um, you know, hearing from them, and that only comes from giving, having the time with them to, you know, get that from them. I think that that's really, really important. Well, I appreciate all of your insight. I think you're brilliant. You're one of the most oh. brilliant people I've ever met. Oh, and um, I'm thrilled to share your knowledge with the audience. So thank you for making the time. I know you're super, super busy. So um, I won't keep you any longer, but thanks so much, Dr. Anderson, for being with us. Thank you. I appreciate you. <laughs> Take good care.